Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. I have a really good guest today, one of my favorites to talk to because he's one of the smartest players I've covered, Logan Paulson. We talked about his post-NFL plans, his thoughts on his former Redskins teammate Jordan Reed, what future Hall of Fame quarterback loves Reed, and I get Paulson's thoughts on some free agent tight ends, one of whom he played with in Atlanta, and some possible draft picks at the position. He always provides excellent insight. And then I answer your podcast questions. One of the topics is Trent Williams. There's one on Bryce Love and more. But first, my conversation with Logan Paulson. Now I'm joined by former Redskins tight end Logan Paulson. And I love talking to Logan because he's one of the smarter players that I've ever covered. And he was a guy that you could learn the game from no matter when you talk to him. So I wanted to bring him on to sh- help him share that knowledge with you guys. And Logan, thanks for joining me, first of all. Yeah, the first thing I want to ask, though, is you're doing the XFL broadcast, the, the analysis with Grant Paulson, no relation. But I'm just curious how you're enjoying that so far. Um, you know, that has actually been uh, a ton of fun for me. You know, it's been a, a big learning experience, kind of a steep learning curve in a way, you know, like you kind of, uh, or at least I've garnered a, a larger appreciation for how tough that, you know, that skill is to learn and acquire. And, uh, you know, but it's been a good time. And like, as you know, Grant's like a great guy to work with. He's so uh, helpful and he's been a great mentor for me in, in this process. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been great for sure. What's cause like that is a different skill and people can know a lot of things and it's hard to get it out. What's been the biggest challenge for you in, in doing that so far? Yeah, I, I think kind of like picking, uh, picking your topic and like something you can get it expressed in like, you know, uh, 10 seconds. And, you know, it's like, you know, as you know, I, I like to talk. I like to kind of delve into the details of, of topics and issues, and especially when it comes to football. And so to kind of kind of get that same detail with a certain amount of brevity has been somewhat challenging to me. Um, but it's been cool. It's, it's kind of, um, you know, made me use an economy of words and challenge me in a way that I find very stimulating. So that's been really fun. It is, it is very challenging like that. How have you liked the play so far in the field? You know, it's interesting. Like, I think I've been, re- we've been really fortunate here in DC to like watch the defenders because the product that they have put on the field and coach Pep Hamilton has, has put on the field has been really good. You know, like, I think it's, you know, it's not quite the NFL, but it, I'd say it's pretty close. And, you know, I think some of these other teams due to kind of like some lacking quarterback play have not looked quite as good, but I think, you know, Cardell Jones has played really well. I think the O-line has done a good job for him and the defense, you know, it, it's, it, it's a group that, they've done a really good job of coaching. And I think like drafting, you know, the draft process in the XFL is a little different than the NFL draft, but you know, I think they did a really good job of compiling like a, a, a very, very solid team. So. Absolutely. I'm, I'm curious for your, for your future. First of all, do you know, do, do you want to try and keep playing or, or, or are you done with that at this point? Um, you know, I, you know, it's interesting. Like I, you know, talking with my wife, I think, I'm probably done. You know, I've been really blessed to to play as long as I have and be relatively healthy. And, um, you know, unfortunately, like the last couple of years, I've lived out of the state of that right. you know, my family's been living in, which has been challenging. But, you know, like my agent called me up the other day and he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to the, the combine soon. Do you want me to like start floating your name? And you're kind of like, you know, as much as I, I think I'm ready to be done and emotionally ready to be done, like there's always that lure of, you know, the game and like how, um, there's nothing quite like it. So, you know, I think for the most part I'm done, but there's always that little party that's like, well, maybe one more, you know what I mean? So. Well, I, I would figure too. And I remember talking to Will Compton about this and I think he seemed like he was okay being at the end. And it's like every year you get after that as a bonus. Do you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. you know, the, he, he felt like, you know, is he done maybe? And then the Raiders call and then you have a good finish. It's like, well, if this ends like this, I'm okay. But if they're going to offer me this, and I can have an opportunity, I still want to play, but you're okay if it's done. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Like, there's, there's just something about the game, you know, like, it's, it's like, it's such a blessing to be able to play it in the NFL, as, you know, I think all of your listeners probably understand, like, it just, it's such a cool experience, and to leave something on the table, I think, is a little, um, you know, like, as a competitor, it kind of eats at you a little bit, but I think Will's got the right idea, you know, like, 
I, I feel like I'm, I'm content. I'm ready. I'm excited for life after football, but also like if something were to come up that was really good or too good to pass up, then, you know, I'd probably have to take a hard look at that. So. So what, what, and again, I tell people, you're one of the smartest guys I've covered. And I've, I think we, you and I have talked about what would you want to do? Because I could see you in either a coach's role or a front office role if you wanted to go that route. Do you know, would you, do you have an idea as far as what you'd want to do and which direction you'd want to take it? Yeah. So, I mean, definitely like I've had some, I've had a couple of coaches, uh, coaching opportunities, you know, like in the last four teams that I've played with, they've all been like, Hey, do you want to get into scouting? Do you want to get into coaching? And there definitely is like, um, that would be really cool. And those opportunities are great, but you know, I don't know how, how much you know about, it. I know you, you know a ton about it, but your, your listeners right. and stuff like the, the coaches hours are kind of insane. You know, they get there at, you know, 5.00 AM, they leave at 10 o'clock at night and they're, they're gone every single weekend. And, you know, like, I, I feel like I just finished doing that kind of thing. And I want to kind of, you know, my, my kids, my son's six and my daughter's three. Like, I want to be here for them more than I have been. So, um, like, that's kind of my priority right now. And, you know, like, if, if I do make that decision to go into coaching, like, I'm going to go into it 100%. But yeah, right now, I think um, that's one of the things that I really like about this broadcasting thing is I still get to watch a lot of football, talk a lot of football. Um, and, but I get the kind of the benefit of being home with my family, which is something that I, I'm really excited about. And, you know, it's funny because people always ask that when, you know, for me, a guy will retire. It's like, oh, they just hire him as a coach. Like, not everybody, want, not everybody wants to do that because once you do that, you know it's a different lifestyle. And yeah. it almost seems like it, in this era, when you've made the money that you guys have, it gives you more freedom if you, you know, if you don't feel like you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. And like, like you said, like the, the money is a big issue. And like I've made some good money over the last 10 years, like not, you know, it's, it's good money for probably like general population, not good money by NFL standards, but it's enough right. money for me and my family. So like I can, like you said, I can be a little bit more selective with what I want to do. And I, and I want to, you know, like I feel like I've, I've prioritized myself for a long time. Like, you know, I had to be very selfish when I was in the NFL to be, to play at a high level. And now like, I feel like it's time for me to um, you know, not take a step back, but kind of prioritize my family a little bit more and, and prioritize my kids and my wife and like kind of support, um, you know, my wife's dreams and then my kids uh, endeavors also. So that's kind of where I'm at with it right now. And we'll see, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe it doesn't work out and I, and I, and I have to get into coaching, but right now I don't have to. So. Well, and, and I also, like I said, I also wonder too about you for a front office role because you're a really good evaluator of talent and that's, a hard skill to find in this league. <laughs> yeah. Would you, you know, if you went that route, and that's, it's still, it's, listen, you know, those guys have brutal hours too, but is yeah. that, which end would appeal to you more? Um, it's, that's, that's a really good question. You know, like I was talking to my agent uh, about this because he was like, you know, if I'm going to push, I want to push in the right direction. And I think, um, and, I, and I do think a front office position, you know, right now, is slightly more appealing to me for whatever reason, maybe because I haven't done it yet. You know, like, right. um, you know, my last couple of years in the league, I was basically like an assistant tight end coach. So I got to see kind of that side of it and do that stuff. And, you know, while that was a lot of fun, I, I do feel like maybe there's some new ground to be covered and like new challenges to be experienced, you know, as a, like kind of as a scout and then maybe, you know, hopefully as a front office person. So that's, that's kind of where my mindset is. And also like, you know, like I do enjoy uh, evaluating talent and like kind of the, the, the constant comparison and chess game that's involved in that. Like, you know, I, I, that, that's, that's kind of intriguing to me also. And again, like I haven't done it yet. So maybe if I got there, I'd be like, oh, well, you know, coaching was a lot better or whatever. Right. But as of right now, I'm kind of intrigued by that. Well, your agent says you're almost never wrong on your evaluations. <laughs> <laughs> he's too easy. He's, I mean, everyone's wrong once in a while so just about limiting how often you're wrong you know what I mean so well one of the guys I wanted to ask you about is a guy that you played with here Jordan Reed because you know he's, he's still in the concussion protocol it's not he's going to be released eventually by the Redskins so end his tenure here but I'm curious what you remember about playing with him and man that guy was fun to watch when he was healthy yeah. I mean, I remember the first time I saw him like out at practice, I remember watching his tape come out of college. He'd just been converted from, from, uh, from quarterback to tight end and his ability to kind of like 
his footwork was so good, his route running, his understanding of zones, like it was just kind of on this next level. And then when he came here, like all of those skills were just at the forefront. And, um, and I kind of knew like my days here were numbered when I saw how, how he was playing um, because of how skilled he was, you know, he just was like, he was such a unique talent. Like I know this is probably not a very, very couth comparison, but like, he reminded me a lot of Aaron Hernandez and say what you want about Aaron Hernandez as a person, but like as a player, he was the cream of the crop in terms of receiving tight ends in the NFL. And I kind of thought Jordan Reed was better. And, but even from day one, the thing that was always the knock against him was like, he was a little injury prone. Like he's not like a, a big robust guy. Like he's, you know, he weighs 245, but it's kind of like a thin 245. Like he's he's got any joints and um, he's not like, he's not built, like a big person. And I think that was something that was always going to be an issue for him. And I, I kind of thought, Oh, well, they'll find a way to manage him. They'll find a way to get him in the game. And, and um, unfortunately that never took off the way that I, that never, his career never got started the way that I, that the way that I thought it should have, like he had some good years, but I really right. thought he was going to be like the best you know, that ever played, yeah. like, I, like, I, you know, watching Kelsey, like, I, I think Kelsey's great, I think Kittle's great, and I think that's the, like, the tragedy of Jordan Reed in a way, like, they pale in comparison to him as a route runner, you know what I mean, yeah. and so, um, I, I've always been, like, like, a huge Jordan Reed fan, and supporting, and, and rooting for him the whole time, but it's just, um, some guys just can't get healthy, and, like, that's, not necessarily that fault. Like they're just built a different way than everybody else, you know. So and, and you know the demands at that position too, because it's like, well, you can use them as a as a as a move tight end, but sometimes you've got to be in the line. You got to be in line because if you're just one thing at that position, it can make the offense predictable when you're in the game. Yeah, so. absolutely. And and I and I do think you know with him especially, like I thought he was good enough that they could have used him in that way, and it would have been fine. And so right. I was always like. You know, why not get a, like a big body guy in here, you know, like, kind of like sprinkle, you know, to, right. to kind of take some of the hits off him and use them in the situations that you want. Like if you look at the way t- like New Orleans used Jimmy Graham back in the day or even the right. way Kansas never, City used, yeah. yeah, the way Kansas City uses Kelsey now, like he basically plays wide receiver and like they really limit the amount of contacts he gets in line in the line of scrimmage because he's getting a lot of contacts when he catches the football. So I think um I, I kind of was always hoping that they'd use him that way. Okay. And they just, they just never, they just never got there with him. You know what I mean? And, and I always yeah. thought that was a little disappointing. And would you, knowing his injury history and the concussions, especially if you're Jordan, would you want to, con- and I know only he can answer this question for himself, yeah. but would you either not want to play, continue playing if you're in that spot or, or advise him not to play or what would you tell him? So, you know, we've talked uh, once or twice over the last couple of years since I've left Washington. And, and you know, I have, a ton of, I have a ton of respect for him. And we have, like, a, a closeness, you know, because ca- he came in right. when I, I, he was a rookie. And, like, there was a little bit of a mentorship there. And, um, you know, he's, he's, in my opinion, like like you said, only he can answer this question. But, uh, you know, like, he's made enough money. Like, it's not about the money. It's about whether he wants to continue or not, whether he feels um, – some type of uh, some type of drive to do to kind of reach the potential that everyone sees in him. Like he, at the time, he mentioned that like he really wants to to potentially win a Super Bowl. You know what I mean? And I think um, and you know he's he's had like I remember we had a joint practice with um, with New England a couple of years ago. I want to say right. it was 2013, maybe. I think that and, was in it was Jay's first year, 2014. Yeah, 2014, and. Um, and Tom Brady, like, fell in love with Jordan. And so I could see him, like, you know, I don't think he'll play. I think he's done as a Washington Redskin, as you said, at the top. But I do think that he, um, like, if a, if a team like New England came and said, hey, Jordan, you want to play, he would go up there and play. And I, and I do th- – and that would make me feel good for him because I do think they'd use him in a way that, um, that's, that would suit his skill set and, like, his um, – his toughness, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it does. And, you know, it's funny because it, everything revolved around so much here that it became hard when he was out. If he goes somewhere else, they're not going to build the offense around him, but they're going to incorporate him into what they do, I would imagine. Why did you say – why? what would do – is Brady's – why did you say Brady fell in love with him? Like, what did you see or hear with that? 
Well, you know, Brady Brady had been exposed to Aaron Hernandez, and I I, right. I remember I remember sitting. I was on a knee right next to Jordan. Brady came over, and he was like, "You like you remind me so much of him." And I and he and Brady said like even like your feet are better than his. You know what I mean? And so like like I think about what Aaron Hernandez and Robert Kowski did for Tom Brady's career, and like Tom Brady's you know arguably the best football player of all right. time. But like you need good players and good receivers to help supplement that talent, and I think he understood what you know, Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski were doing for him. And I think like having a guy like Aaron Hernandez and like Jordan, Jordan has the same skill set that right. can win consistently on third down that can't be guarded by a linebacker or a strong safety. Like that is an extreme, uh, that provides an extreme comfort level for the quarterback because they know like in this situation, if we get this coverage, like I can go here and this player is going to win. And that's something that Jordan, in my opinion, always had. Like I remember him like, you know, you know, Josh uh, Norman got signed to the Redskins and then right. doing one on ones. And he was like, I want to cover Jordan and Jordan like routing him up. And like <laughs> and, and, and so like for, for, for a tight end to be able to do that to one of the best corners in the league at the time was like kind of unheard of. You know what I mean? So like right. that skill set is so is so important. And I think Tom Brady recognized recognized that even then when, you know, Jordan was a very young player. So I, I could totally see them kind of you know, rolling the dice because they have that reputation of kind of rolling yeah. the dice on players with, you know, checkered injury, injury history or checkered pass. Not that Jordan has that, but the injury history definitely. The injury. And, and with them, like, there's less of a risk than if you were the Redskins keeping them at a $10.5 million, yes. $10.3 million cap hit. So it's a little bit different. If you can get them on a minimum deal, it's like, and if he still wants to play, then it's different. Let me ask you about some other tight ends who are now free agents because the Redskins will be in the market for some. One guy you know is Austin Hooper. What is your evaluation of him? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, to me, Austin is one of the he, – he has, he has played himself into, like, the top five, er, like, uh, area of the tight end position. You know, I think, the, you know, the top couple guys are probably, uh, you know, Kelsey, Kittle, Ertz. And then I think, you know, Hooper's in that range in terms of production and um, an ability to win uh, versus man-to-man -man coverage. Like, that's what we talked about, what made Jordan right. so valuable. Hoop has, over the last two years, like, that was a question mark for him. Over the last two years, has shown that he has that ability. He's a smart guy. He's from Stanford. He can, he's serviceable in line, which, you know, now, like, you know, Kittle has kind of made that popular again. Like, having yeah. a well Serviceable is good at this point. Yes, that's exactly right. And so, like, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. Yeah, I mean, no, I know. Kind of to his credit, because a lot of these guys, like Kelsey, you know, doesn't really play in line. You know, um, you know, uh, Jimmy Graham doesn't play in line. Those guys, you know, Eric Ebron doesn't play in line anymore. Right. They don't have that skill set. And so to have a guy who can do, um, who can win on third down and can block a defensive end is is a very rare package these days. And he definitely has that. And, you know, to me, like, the the one – like he's just, he's a little different personality and, um, you know, he fits in really well with the culture in Atlanta. And so it would be interesting to see like how he'd fit here with Ron Rivera. And also I think another interesting point is that like, you know, Matt Ryan for all of his faults, he's a, is a very talented quarterback, former MVP. Right. And like here in Washington, like, um, you know, you can get all the skill positions you want in the world, but if you don't have a quarterback, you're gonna have a hard time. And, and I think there's still, obviously, there's still some question about where Dwayne Haskins will go with his career. So, you Absolutely. know, I mean, how, how much do you think he'll look at that? Because, you know, you, always, you, got, you know guys want to get paid, but when you're in a receiving position, whether a tight end or a receiver, how much do you think he'll look at a team's quarterback situation? So, you know, he, uh, Austin and I have the same agent. We talk fairly regularly, and I've advised him on that specifically. Like, it's not about the biggest payday. It's about where you, you feel you can get the most money and be the most consistent. And, like, you see guys, like, I think a good example is, like, Eric Decker when he was in. He's obviously the receiver for um, – Right. Yeah, when he was in Denver, had a very productive career. And then he ended up going to, I think, uh, uh, New York, and they didn't have a quarterback. Yeah, and he just kind of felt – he just kind of disappeared, you know. And um, you, have to, you have to kind of be aware of, of that. When you're when you're making those decisions, especially when you're receiving player, obviously like money's money, and I think that's a big factor. Like if you look at Demarco Murray, like he went to uh, Philadelphia a couple of years ago, right. and like he he only liked running out of like 
the dot I like with a fullback and they only right. ran offset run guns. So he didn't like his production dip, but at least he, he had that money. He was able to invest it, able to take care of himself with it. So I, I personally have advised Austin like to think about that. That's a big thing that I think he should think about. Um, I haven't specifically talked about Washington, but you right. know, I do think that was something that I would encourage him and anybody that I've played with in the past to like, think about critically, like just know, like, this deal might look great on paper, but if you only play one year of it, like what is that worth for you? You know what I'm saying? So that, that, I think that's a huge factor. Have you seen enough of Dwayne Haskins to offer anything about where you think he's going or what, what do you think? So yeah, with Dwayne, I mean, I've watched, uh, you know, a fair, a fair amount of them, you know, like not, I haven't like studied him, but I've right. watched some of them and like, you know, we've talked about this a little bit before, like to me, like everyone talks about his arm strength and, to me, like there's some other issues there that he really is going to have to work very hard on to get fixed if he wants to be a great player. I'm not saying that he can't be a great player. I do think he has the skill set to be a great player, but I do think like he needs to really work on his awareness in the pocket and his accuracy, really. And like, you know, there is some debate on how much you can work on that, but if he needs to get that cleaned up a little bit, you know, like he needs to work on his anticipation, his accuracy, his footwork. And those are things that I think guys can improve on, but it is challenging and you're going to need to really like invest yourself and he's got a new offensive coordinator coming in. And so you kind of wonder, like, I, I wonder, you know, I don't know him at all. So I, I kind of, my question would be like, how good of a student is he? Like how quick is he right. going to pick this offense up? Like those are factors that um, like, what kind of professional is he, you know, like he had that issue where he wasn't on the field for like the last play of the game. Uh, right. um, I don't I forget what game that was, but you know, like right. those things, you know, they're not like, that's not like a fatal issue, but it does make you question if I'm like a GM or if I'm like another team or if I'm a coach, like I'm, I wonder about his, his dedication to his craft. And I look at all the things he has to work on to all the things he has to improve. And I say like, does he have the work ethic um, to get there? And again, I don't know him. And, right. you know, some people say like, I've talked to a couple of guys in the building, like Ryan a little bit. He says like, he, he, he does work. He's a good preparer. You know what I mean? And here he's improving in those areas, I should say. Right. Um, so, you know, it's really up to him and whether he get those things done. Absolutely. So a couple other tight ends, Hunter Henry. Yeah. So Hunter Henry is a guy that I haven't watched a ton of, but we just haven't, haven't had like a lot of crossover with him, but I, I think he's, he's very close to Hooper. I think he's probably a, I don't know. I, I again, I don't, I can't speak to this for sure. Cause I haven't seen them. I haven't seen him in person. Like I know Hooper very well and right. I know he moves and all that stuff, but, he seems to be a really good athlete. He's like, I remember watching his tape coming out of college and I was like, this could go one of two ways. Either he could be a super consistent, great pro, or he's, his skill set isn't good enough. And talk about a guy who's just grown up tremendously over the last three years and like just kind of rode uh, the success he had in college and like into, into his NFL career. Everyone kind of gives him a hard time for injury history, but you know, he's played a lot of football. Like he only missed one year and he's missed, he missed four games last year, but like, I don't think that's like, that should be, I, I know GMs and teams will use that against him in terms of not paying him as much, Absolutely. but I do think he's a really good player. I think he's, he's like kind of a football playing Johnny, you know what I mean? Like yeah. maybe not the biggest or the fastest guy, but he's, he's got really good savvy and he's a good athlete. And I think those things show up on tape when you watch him. Um, yeah. But so like the big criticism I've, I've read about him and I've heard about him is that he's injury prone, but like he had, he tore his ACL in a preseason game. Like, those things happen. This is football, you know, like Owen Daniels tore his ACL in his ninth year and never, no one, no one said anything about him being injury prone, but like, you know, maybe because it's early in his career, he gets that knock against him. So I just, I, you know, like, obviously you don't want a guy to get hurt. You want him to be healthy. I think he has the potential to be healthy, like throughout his career. Um, it's just about whether you're willing to take the gamble after he's had an issue with his knee. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron, man, this is a guy that I, um, I, you know, I, like I watched his film come out of college. I evaluated him and I didn't love him coming out. Like he seemed a little stiff. He seemed a little soft and those things have kind of, um, he, he couldn't play in line and, and like some people say, Oh, he'll grow out of those things. But in my opinion, he hasn't really grown out of them. Like he had a, he had a really productive year two years ago, but other than that, he's been, you know, kind of middle of the road, you know, and right. I think he's probably going to want like a big deal. I would imagine just from what I've heard about him and his personality. And I, I just, to me, like, yeah, he's a good player. And you know, like the interesting thing about him and the Redskins, for example, is he, he, 
he would fit a role that Greg Olson, him and him and Greg Olson to me are very comparable. Like essentially they, uh, in Carolina, they used Greg Olson as a wide receiver quite a bit to kind of like right. um, undress coverages and like get good matchups. And so Eric Ebron would be really good for that role. But Greg Olson also played in, in the line of scrimmage. Now he's not the best blocker, but at least he's a willing blocker. Right. And I'm not sure that Eric Ebron is willing to block anybody. Like, so okay. he, he fits like he fits half of that equation really well. And the other thing about Greg that's I think really undervalued is he's a, he's tough. You know, you don't play 13 or 14 years in the NFL right. not being extremely tough. And I'm not sure Ebron Ebron is that same guy. You know, I think that's yeah. like he's like poor man's uh, Greg Olson if that makes. Sense. All right, and Logan, I've already kept you longer than I probably thought I would, that I told you. But if I can ask you just a couple more questions about guys in the draft, because there's a chance if they don't get one of these tight ends that you're looking at a guy in that third, fourth round area. And I don't – have you had a chance to look at many guys in this draft? So I, um, I've looked at a couple guys. Like, um, I know we talked a little bit about the kid from Stanford and the kid right, from Right, Kobe State. Parkinson. Yeah, and so – I, I, you know, we actually have the same agent, surprisingly enough, him and then the kid from UCLA also. Devin Asiasi. Is it, yes. is, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Devin uh-huh. Asiasi. Yeah. Just like yeah. it's Yeah, absolutely. And so the thing that I think they, they are both impressive in really different ways. Like um, Kobe's a tall kid. He's a former basketball player. He's a good athlete. Like they lined him up out wide quite a bit. I don't know right. if he's got that skill set for the NFL, but I think he has an opportunity to grow into a like you know he's think I think he's like 245 right now and I think he's just he's just like a puppy he's 20 years old he's like he's got so much room for growth and I think that's exciting if you're a coach you know you can get him in an NFL weight room you can get him on get him eating more you can get him focused completely on football because you know Stanford like you got to kind of you got to be a student also which is not the case for a lot of these schools and the, the other thing that was really impressive about him when I went and worked with him was like he is so, so, so smart and so detail oriented. Like from a mental perspective, he is a hundred percent ready for the NFL. And as a coach, like that is super exciting and super uh, assuring because you're like, Oh, okay. Like at least I know he knows what's going on. At least he knows how to be a pro. And so that's something that's really, um, that, I, that I, I really liked when I was working with him. And I'm also, like I said, like I mentioned, I think as a, from a growth perspective, I think that's also really cool. The kid, uh, Devin, from UCLA, I think is kind of um, – it, it, he's – he reminded me a lot of, like, a bigger, more durable Jordan Reed. I know that's okay. a big – like, a big comparison, but he's, like, two – I want to say he's, like, 255, 260, something like that right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think he played at, like, 270 at UCLA. But in terms of, like, his footwork and his body control, he is, like – he's a very special athlete for how big he is and how kind of, like – and I think one of the one of the great things about him is that like you know how Jordan is kind of this slight frame, this kid Devin is like the opposite. He's big bone, big framed. You know he's Samoan. His dad's a huge man. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. just are. He's just built thicker, like more robust. And I think that that kind of if I was a coach, I would be really excited about the way he moves for how big he is. And also like um, you know not as smart as um, Kobe, but very engaged and football is important to him and like that to me that's really important if I'm going to draft a guy and just so people know if I remember right you were one of the ones who were pushing George Kittle before that draft just as an example of your yeah. evaluation skills if I remember right so that's correct yeah. isn't it yeah no so like I remember everyone was like oh he's gonna play fullback he's gonna you know he'll just be a special teams guy and I remember watching his tape and being like are we watching the same tape like <laughs> this guy can like really really run and he's and he jumps and he can and he's super competitive like that was the thing about Kittle's tape and you turn it on like he didn't catch a ton of balls but he was like physical and tough and like and just played super hard and like when you kind of have that you know that meeting of like a great athlete and a really competitive football player you you have the potential to be something special but again I think one of the reasons that he slipped so far Kittle slipped so far in the draft is because of his injury history people right. get really really nervous about that kind of thing Folks, now you can tell why I enjoy talking to Logan a lot and why he has a future in this business, whichever direction he goes. He's very smart. Logan, I appreciate you giving me so much of your time um, and providing the level of insight you just did. Thank you, man. John, thanks so much for having me on, man. Really awesome. After this break, I'll be back with your mailbag questions. 
What sort of quarterback do I think they should pursue? Why does Trent Williams want guaranteed money? And is this the most hope I've seen since I started covering the Redskins? I'll answer those questions in a minute. Okay, now I'm back, and it's time for your podcast mailbag questions. Let's jump right to it. Strick9 at Spider Strick wants to know, as I'm guessing you really don't really know who, I'll ask what kind of backup quarterback do you suspect they sign? I assume they'll give Alex every chance, but there has to be a legit contingency plan, right? Yes, there does, because nobody can tell you even right now if Alex Smith will be ready, and we're 15 months from his injury. I'm not expecting him to be out there, but they certainly haven't ruled him out. God bless the man for what he's doing, and they've been highly respectful of him him throughout the process by not counting him out because I think they just feel like, again, the phrase you always hear is if anybody can do it, he can. But, yeah, you better have a plan. I think, I think we'll get a feel for what they truly think by what they do in free agency. My belief is that they'll want someone who can at least give Dwayne Haskins a push or at least a series of some strong nudges. Somebody who can start if he's not ready, but someone who can be okay in a backup role. Case Keenum was that kind of guy, and he's the kind of guy that I'd look for. He's also, of course, he's free. Ken Zampezi has ties to A.J. McCarron, having coached him for three years in Cincinnati, but he's not at Keenum's level. Zampezi also coached Drew Stanton in Cleveland. He's also free. We'll see what Carolina does at quarterback. Kyle Allen is is an exclusive rights free agent, so he's easy to keep for the Panthers, But if he becomes free because they draft somebody and they have Will Greer um, and they don't know what they're doing with Cam Newton, then maybe that's a guy who interests them because of the ties to Scott Turner. It's not a great spot to be in because of Smith's uncertainty and the size of that contract. I think the size of that contract will limit what you're going to spend there because even if you cut him, he's going to be part of that salary cap. Um, But again, let's see what moves they make because that will tell us quite a bit. But that's the level I'm kind of thinking they'll look at. I think it's been hard to get a great feel for that, but that's where I would lean right now. Um, Real Robert Anderson at the B Mock 95. Why would the team have to guarantee Trent's 2020 salary? As a vested vet, his salary is guaranteed if he's on the week one roster, right? Yes, it is. But if something happens before that point, it isn't guaranteed. And that's why players seek greater security especially in the last year of a deal. That's why he wants it. Now, he could always choose not to report until the season begins. I can't imagine Ron Rivera wanting that sort of a distraction. I can't imagine that anybody listening to this wants that kind of a distraction. I can tell you nobody talking right now wants that either. I also think that with one year left, you could extend Williams. Before this past year, would anyone have batted an eye at that notion? No. So if they still want him around and Rivera did reach out to him, he clear, and he clearly would have done so with Dan Snyder's blessing, then it makes sense to extend him as well. I do believe, and th- again, that's going to have to be on Trent Williams, whether or not he wants to be here, but I do believe some players think this will get worked out and Williams will stick around. That's not a report. That's just something, you know, like, is, anyway, it's not a report, but just that's just what I think. It will not happen without money involved, but I think the fact that neither side said to heck with you is a good start. So now, to me, it's just about the scratch. And I think that will be easier to work out than all the other issues, plus the money that they had to deal with in the past. We'll see. My feed, at Go Jibs. So Joe Gibbs, whatever. Funny. Is all, the recent, is all of the recent changes at Redskins Park justification for more hope than any prior time since you've been covering the Skins? All right, go Jibs. I learned long ago not to get caught up in that hope machine when it comes to this franchise. I felt there was a lot of hope. Heck, I'll go back to 97. I think it was 97 when they brought in Big Daddy and Dana Stubblefield. People were talking Super Bowl. A few years later, they, they bring in all these guys after winning the division, you know, Deion Sanders, Bruce, Bruce Smith, and you're talking Super Bowl. You're hearing Super Bowl. And then there was the Marty Schottenheimer era. Marty was a, a damn good coach when he came here. Then when Joe Gibbs was here and when they paired Mike Shanahan and Bruce Allen, 
I know Allen is hated now, but 10 years ago when he was first hired, he wasn't. Instead, it w- he was viewed as a strong business guy. So that was considered a good pairing. But this is the most I've felt in a while, I'll say that. Rivera is a good coach. He does not have the track record of a Schottenheimer or Shanahan, and certainly not Gibbs. But I think where the optimism lies is here. Snyder does not have his guy involved in the operation of the team. There's no Vinny Serrato, whom I always felt would hold the Gibbs regime back. There's no Allen anymore, who turned into someone that thought he knew a lot more than he did about the football side of things. Serrato and Allen had Snyder's ear, unlike anybody else. Now, there's Snyder, and then there's the football side, at least for now. There's nobody that's going to be funneling Snyder's desires to the coaches or to the scouts or whatever. Those guys are gone. So we don't know what Rivera will do with all the power that he has now and how it will go, but Snyder's lessening role is a good thing. I think that's where you can have that hope as long, as long, as long as it continues. And, but like I said, you guys have been burned by all that hope machine before, and I don't want to sit there and tell you that it's, the, that it's the most. I just think they're coming out of a very dark period, and so it's probably been one of the darker periods they've had, and I think that's where, and it was, you know, I think that's where you get that level of hope is you're coming out of that, you've got somebody established coming in, and it's a different setup. And I do, I'll tell you this, I think another good sign for the hope is having Kyle, a guy like Kyle Smith involved in, in, in an expanded role on the personnel side. Um, I think that's an important aspect of this, too, that can't be overlooked, um, is how they've done that and the continue. And I'll be curious to see how they continue to, to add or what they do at the front office, because I think that will give you a, a different sense of it as well. Um, all right, James Tishner at Tishner James wants to know, say they were able to move down to five or six and get a first rounder next year. How do you reject that? Personally, I'd roll the dice in the Dolphins being the bottom, th- bottom, a bottom three team next season, especially if they're starting a rookie QB. Well, first of all, we don't know. Assume the, the assumption would be that they take Tua there. Let's just assume that for now. We don't know if Tua is even going to be ready to start the season. So we don't know that they're going to be starting a rookie season, a rookie quarterback all year. Um, I, I do like the way the Dolphins finish. But you, I think to me, you, you clearly need more than just a first rounder next year. But I'm guessing you knew that. But you were asking about, I'm assuming, in addition to whatever else. They'd have to get another first, a second, and then a first next year for it to be truly tempting, in my opinion. One evaluator I talked to said he wouldn't want to trade it, but the way he'd be tempted would be if they offered him two firsts and a start and a starting player. But based on the way, again, Miami finished, I wouldn't count on them being bottom three. I think the hard part here is knowing whether, again, whether or not two will be ready to start the season and then what they do. Um, I do like Brian Flores as a coach, so I think they're going to be better. But I think you can, I think you can look at the Dolphins and say you figure they could be at in, in or near the top 10 in terms of draft pick, a draft standing in 2021. If I'm trading that number, if I'm trading though, if I'm going to trade this pick, I want a number one pick next year for this reason. If Dwayne Haskins doesn't progress the way they need or hope, then you have more ammo to move up in 2021 for a quarterback. You can almost already anticipate two players who would be top picks in Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. There are always others who come out of nowhere. There, that's been the case in each of the last few drafts. So they could end up to be a very good class, and this gives you more ammo. And listen, if Haskins, if Haskins does well, then you're okay because now you have two first-round picks you can use on other guys. Then you're in even better shape if he does well. But if he doesn't, now you have some more ammo. Um, I don't think this is a no-brainer trade. Um, I wrote about this for ESPN a, a week or so ago. More clearly, and I would suggest checking that out because I, what I did is I took a look at a number of, of trades over the last five, six, seven years, or maybe I'm going about back, maybe about six, seven years, of guy, teams that traded from that top spot and traded back. It, has, it doesn't always work out. And, and I think especially like the one team that worked out for was Indianapolis. They traded back a couple years ago. I got Quentin Nelson, but they weren't looking at Chase Young. And so I think that, you know, that worked out for them. But again, they didn't pass up a Chase Young. You know, the Browns passed on Khalil Mack a few years ago. That draft was a bomb for them. Okay, the, the 49ers didn't pass on Nick Bosa last year. 
that worked out well for them. But having said that, the Niners really didn't have an option to trade because there was no other quarterback there to really tempt anybody to move up and do it. If Kyler Murray had fallen to two, then they're trading, but then they don't have Nick Bosa. So, you know, I, but that's, but again, my, my point in saying all that is more doesn't always equal better or greater. The Redskins need elite talent. The way I trade is if they don't view Chase Young as being that much better than, say, a Jeffrey Okuda or an Isaiah Simmons or whomever else they might want to draft at five or six. Otherwise, get elite players. All right, Nats fan, at Nats fan underscore 101. When is Jordan Reed going to officially be released? It sounds like when he's cleared. Thing is, it doesn't matter all that much. I spoke to someone who knows this stuff really, really well, and he told me that the Redskins don't need to release him with an injury settlement. He already collected his money for the season in which he was hurt, which of course was 2019. Now, if he's released before he passes a physical, he's entitled to injury protection. However, and this was explained to me, none of his base salary is guaranteed this year, which means he's not entitled to a $1.2 million injury protection as spelled out in the CBA. Again, because it was a 2019 injury and it does not affect his 2020 salary because it's not guaranteed. But because he signed through 2021, he's entitled to extended injury protection at a max of, I believe it's 660,000. So there's not much benefit to them necessarily in waiting based on what I was told by, again, someone who really, really knows this stuff. But I think that's what they're waiting for. So, and it does save them a little bit of scratch. Um, I don't know what Reed is going to do beyond that. I think it's an interesting thing to watch. Um, let's see, we got two more here. I'll try and go quick. Dave Pedigo, I think it is, at Dave Pedigo. Assuming the Redskins draft Chase Young, what is the next biggest need on defense? Inside linebacker, safety, or corner? I think it depends on what they do in free agency, of course. Do they sign a corner? How many? That, to me, is the next biggest thing because third down is, is such an important one. You get the pass rush solidified, and then you need the coverage. The rest will fall into place. I would put safety high on the list just because Monte Nicholson has not been good enough to overcome other things, whether it's durability, whether it's just the play, whatever. And then there's, all, there's, all, there's been a couple off-field things, as we know. I know one of Rivera's first calls was to Cole Holcomb. I do believe he really likes him. I'm not sure yet in what role, whether it's inside or outside. I'm guessing he stays inside. Right now, that's just a guess. But I know that it seems like with what Rivera likes, he wants his inside linebacker to know the defense, to be able to make the calls. Right now, that would be Cole Holcomb. I think John Bostic, if they re-signed him, could be in that role too. I do not view Reuben Foster that way. We don't even know if he'll be ready or when he'll be ready. He is not a guy who excelled at calling signals in San Francisco. So I think he'd be really good as a weak side guy. I, all I know with Holcombs, I've been told that, that Rivera likes him and did so before the draft last year, but was rejected by his scouts in Carolina. No pressure at Gone Ride, at G O N underscore Ride. Has there been any update on Bryce Love or for the plan the last regime initially had for him? Okay, and I want to answer this because I've been asked a lot about love, which sounds like the start of a bad romantic comedy in which I'm some sort of love doctor. I am not. Okay, let's move on. Pretend you didn't hear that. I do not have a great update on Bryce Love. There's been so much focus on other players or coaches. I do know there are people who remain who love the guy and view him as someone who could have been a much higher pick had he come out the year before, or if he'd been healthy. I don't know that it'd be an every down back for what Rivera and Scott Turner want if they want somebody who's more of a slam it in there type, which is why Adrian Peterson, I definitely expect him to be back, though they haven't made it official with his option. That's just, to me, becoming a technicality, but I've heard nothing that suggests he wouldn't be back. But I think it'll be interesting to see what happens if Love is healthy and Darius Geis is healthy. Both are coming off injuries, but Geis, of course, has suffered three knee injuries in his first two years here. And I know some wonder about how the fact that he's a violent runner, how much would that limit his durability going forward? Um, I think Love could also fill a third down role with Chris Thompson possibly gone as a free agent. Now, I think Love would have to work on some things there, of course. I don't know that he could come in and do it right away, um, but I do think he has that skill set. But I definitely think if he's right, I definitely think that he could be more of an every three down back. It does help love that Randy Jordan, the running backs coach, remains. I know he was high on him too. 
Okay, well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much to Logan Paulson for being so generous with his time with me. And thank you for your questions and, as always, for listening. <laughs>